Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamualaikum. Well, to the Muslim. My name is Irwan. I'm from World Islamic Mint. And I'm not as exciting as the two previous speakers before me. Because I'm neither a coach, I'm neither a coach, nor a consultant, but just a worker for World Islamic Mint. There you are. You are the one I've been waiting for. Okay, <laughs> so I hope I excite you somehow. Um, in my talk, I will not be talking about investments. I'll be talking about the rise of gold dinar and silver dirham. But thanks to William, as well as Jonathan, I know when I need to stop my bullions to mint more coins. Okay, let's start. Our brief agenda for tonight will be the primers, a prime on dinar and dirham, dinar and dirham in modern times, dinar and dirham today and tomorrow, and finally the dinar revolution. Can I just check with the MC how many minutes do I have? 45, okay. That gives me about a minute plus for each slide. Okay. What is the gold dinar and silver dirham? Can I see a show of hands? How many of you, for this is the first time that you've heard of dinars and dirhams? Okay, quite a fair number of you. So I will have to start with some basic introduction. Okay, we all know throughout civilization, man, humankind has used precious metals as mediums of exchange or money. So for us Muslims, we started to mint our coins as well from eight, uh, sorry, 685 common era. Okay? That was about 50 years after our Prophet Muhammad. And similarly for our first silver dirhams, it was printed, minted about 730 common era. So what were we using before that? Well, if you see the name of the coins, the dinar actually came from denarius, which is what the Romans or Byzantines were using. And the dirhams, the name came from drachma, which is what the Sassanids or Persian Empire were using. So when our um, community started to grow, the second caliph, or president if you like it, started to establish a standard um, which has been effectively in use since then until today. And what is the standard? It's very simple. The standard is based on weight. The weight of 7 dinars is equal to the weight of 10 dirhams. Okay? You got that? Very simple, right? So the weight of 7 dinars is equal to 10 dirhams. Now that is the most established standard of dinars and dirhams since the time of our second caliph at 6, 640 CE. So, now we go throughout the brief history of um, dinar and dirham as exchange, mediums of exchange throughout the empires. Of course, as uh, precious metals, gold and silver, you can barter it as a good. If I have a card, a bullock card, and you have a piece of gold coin, it makes for a fair value of exchange. So we just barter it, dinar and dirham. Eventually, it became uh, an efficient medium of exchange. So rather than barter goods that are homogeneous, we use dinars and dirhams as mediums of exchange to more efficiently trade. So it developed into a full-fledged money um, and, and then currency. Minor difference. Currency means there's better denomination, denominational values, proper standards and weights and so on. And in terms of it being Sharia currency, it means that it applies 
to certain uh, religious laws and legal ethics in our religion. For example, uh, back in those days, if you want to chop off somebody's hand for te theft, it has to be a uh, for theft greater than a quarter dinar. Okay, so you don't you don't just chop off things for one dirham. Anyway, um, oh, sorry. And because precious metals for more than a thousand years function as very stable measures of value, the whole empire, the whole Islamic empire, and of course the other uh, Roman empires and so on, used bimetallic currencies. And we have what we call here uh, localized money, which are now legacies. For example, in the era of the last caliph, we had this gold lira. So remember, Jonathan was saying about the Turkish lira. This was the origins of the lira. This was before lira became fiat money. So this is the gold lira. And surprise, surprise, Malaysia has its own localized legacy money as well, which is in our satu ringgit, if you can read that in Jawi. Okay, this is our silver money. Okay, so throughout the Muslim empire, we had official currency called dinar and dirham, which were the measures of value that relates to many uh, religious legal laws, and we had local currencies as well. Okay. So what happened? What happened after more than a thousand years of using bimetallic currencies? We had, even in the United States, when Colum Columbus, Christopher Columbus came over, they had this real money, gold and silver. We were fine with that. Gold, silver money, we were fine with that. And then we had promissory notes. Okay, if you can read the small print here, I think uh, Jonathan, I think, gave the same thing. So these promissory, promissory notes were redeemable, redeemable in gold on demand. So give this note to the bank and you'll get your gold. So to, to most people, that sounds okay, but we had some issues with it. The Muslims had some issues with it. But to most people, it was as good as Go. Now what happened next? We had the premium certificates for gold deposits. Now do you follow me? Premium certificates for gold deposits. And this is it. Okay, used for our gold deposits, ladies and gentlemen. Now fiat money is entering the final phase of being worthless. And it will be soon be used for our gold deposits. Okay. So now we move on to, to see who did it. Who, in this modern day and age, came again and took the trouble to reintroduce Dinar and Dirham to us. So this is where I'm at, the World Islamic Mint. Its roots, the realization and restoration of real money. From the leader of a Muslim movement called Murabitun, Sheikh Dr. Abdul Qadir al Sufi, came an understudy of him, Sheikh Professor Omar Ibrahim Vadilu, who himself is a convert from a Catholic to a Muslim. So when he studied the religion for his conversion, he realized that a lot of our legal matters were not satisfied with the current forms of money available today. Uh, a bit complicated. So it means that fiat money cannot satisfy our religious obligations. So what do you do? He asked around all the existing scholars of the day, why are we not using gold and silver money? No one could answer. So he did more studies and so on and so on. So he was among the early pioneers in modern times 
to study and put effort to reintroduce the dinar and dirham to the people. And our chairman currently is uh, Ra'is, uh, Ra'is means President Abu Bakar Riga, who is a German based in Germany. And they are from the same group of European Muslims who revived this idea of introducing dinar and dirham. So what did we do? What did we do to try and bring it back to the people? We spoke to the Muslim leaders of the time. So we spoke to Dr. Erbakan, the former Prime Minister of Turkey. We spoke to King Hassan of Morocco. And of course, most of us know, we spoke to, to Dr. Mahdi. So, important lesson learned here tonight. We were the ones who planted the seed of idea into Tun Mahadev about the gold dinar and the silver dirham. So we did some inception work there. Huh? Inception. Okay. Uh, but just to backtrack a bit, why did Tun Mahadev did not have success in implementing the dinar? It was a difficult time for him. Uh, he realized that the fallacies of the world financial system uh, came about because of the fiat, fiat money, okay, worthless fiat money, and that's what happened to our currency in 97-98 crisis. Uh, but shortly after, he stepped down. I am still trying to get Abdullah Badawi to understand the concept of the dinar, but his time is up as well. Unfortunately, our leadership, with our leadership today, the RM is too strong. So go figure. <laughs> okay. So we had several trials and errors of minting the coins. We did it first in Granada, primitive technology. And then we had partners with Indonesian Muslims, IMN and WIN, more details on our website if you care to find out the, what the acronym stands for. Uh, we had to strike out IMN after that. And we had our IGD episode in Malaysia. We minted coins, but uh, gold turns people greedy. So we had to strike off IGD as well. They started to go into investment schemes. Anyway, um, and we had the Hajj series uh, from uh, Dubai, which are still in production and has been updated to the latest standards. And our, our most successful story to date is the Kelantan Dinar and Dirham, launched in 2010. Okay, so these are some of the monies that we came up with. So the currency that we are using now for WM, the sharing currency of course, not to be confused with legal tender, mind you. Uh, these are the standards for the dinar at 4.25 grams of 917 gold for one dinar, and the rest are all linear. And for dirham is 2.975 grams of 999 silver for one dirham, and the rest being linear measurements. So this is our latest standard, but we are continuously seeking to improve the standards of the coins. Ah, so I showed this too fast for you. <laughs> so are we alone in the market? Dinar and dirham? No. You can see here, there's loads and loads and loads of dinar and dirham in the market. So I'm representing the World Islamic Mint with our standardized coins. Currently, uh, the best seller is of course the Klantan Dinar and Dirham in Malaysia. But for the rest of the coins, in public, in public, I have two words for these minters. No comment. Okay, why? Because to us, you know, it's either 
they are detracting from our true mission, which I'll be explaining soon after this. Or it's merely a distraction because of the glitter of gold. So everyone wants to get into the business of making money through producing coins. But what I will share with you after this, you will have to learn and evaluate for yourself whether we are the same as the other minters around. So why? Why us? Why the world Islamic mint? Gold dinar and silver dinar. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, dinars and dirhams are just the tip of the iceberg. Our mission is not to profiteer or to make money out of selling coins. Our mission is back to our religion, which is to bring back the Muslims into fulfilling our obligations to God. So the idea behind introducing, reintroducing dinar and dirham, there are more meanings to it. There are more movements to it and more mechanisms than just the coins. Here we see, in terms of uh, structural position, the World Islamic Mint will be supervising other specific purpose entities to make the ultimate goal a reality. What is the ultimate goal? It's to bring back the practice of the Muslims back to how it was in the days of uh, Medina. Okay? Medina, as you know, was the birthplace of where the Islamic society grew. Of course, our main focus is still Mecca, but Medina is where the society developed and grew under the guidance of our Prophet and his closest companions. So there are means. There are wakalas, wadiyas, and a core body to manage other matters. So the means produce the coins. The wakalas are agents. For the time being, they are agents to get the coins to the public by exchanging fiat to real money. Now, wadiyas are interesting because they function as banks before banks were the norm. Okay, get this. Most of us here are less than 50 or 100 years old. The banks are a novelty. In the past, we had different forms of safekeeping, transactional processing, and for general purpose, uh, money management. We had what we call wadiyas. Okay? So wadiyas, when reintroduced, is an alternative to the banking system, which is the bane of the worsening financial system today. And our co-op, to be introduced very soon, will function as a trade network coordinator so that traders who use our coins in transactions are within a system that gives them the best benefit. There's more to it which we explain in our regular activity. I'll get to that. So dinar dirham today, the best of course in Malaysia is the dinar and dirham Kelantan from the Kelantan state government. We have our weekly event called Dini Hari Dinar. Dini Hari means the dawn of the dinner, in which we impart this knowledge to the audience. Why dinar, why dirham, what next, what now, how, when, who, why, and so on. Okay? So you are free every Saturday oops, from 10 to 4. Do join us in our program called Dini Hari Dinar. Oh, there's market activities too, so you can actually experience the practical reality of using dinars and dirhams in transactions. Now this is one of our featured activity. This is simply a sticker 
or label showing we accept dinar and dirham. Now, why is this important? As you know, the dinar and dirham is not merely precious metals for savings to us. It can be used as a medium of exchange. So in order to materialize this mission, we give out this to traders to begin accept the, accepting the coins as a medium of exchange, as a mode of payment. Optional, willing basis, you like, I like, we do the transaction. So this is our forte and our focus to expand the range of trading network. We are also electronically enabled with an entity called eDinar in Dubai. It's, I would say that it is still a bit primitive in the wake of our very advanced financial system, but essentially eDinar allows you to keep your goal in accounts, and if you have two parties having accounts with eDinars, you can transact electronically over the internet. So there are efforts underway to make using gold and silver a practical reality. You don't have to carry a ton of gold to buy your house or your car, because we do intend to introduce all these facilities and convenience to make it a rival to today's services. What about tomorrow? Okay, this is uh, the proposed update to our dinar and dirham standards, um, which contains several new features that we have identified to make it better for the users. So better, many meaning, it may be harder, it may be more secure, it may be more lasting. It shines better. It's not so clear here, but if you can see, uh, for the dinar, for example, the new standards will incorporate a hologram so that it will be pretty tough to come to face this coin. Um, the dirham, silver, as you know, silver tarnishes easily over time, so we're coming up with alloy technologies that can prevent silver tarnishing too easily, too quickly, so that it looks and lasts longer. And we're going to have some small change. Uh, this, is, this is an example of a historical copper coin which in our circles we call the fulus. So I guess that's where the, the word loose change comes from, fulus. Okay, so these are our plans for tomorrow, the dinar and the dinar tomorrow. Okay, um, just to backtrack a bit, why the fulus? Why the loose change? Because currently the silver, the smallest denomination of silver at one dirham has an equivalent rate of Ringgit Malaysia, 25. So you can't buy that many things uh, at 25 Ringgit and above, especially for students. Most of our expenses are 10 Ringgit or below. So we need small change. Currently, we're using Ringgit Malaysia. Kelantan is only the starting point. We have plans and preparation well underway to get other states to also mint dinars and dirham. Okay, these red dots are not reflective of our activity. This is just a copy and paste graphic from the internet. But we do have other states in Malaysia. We do have societies, Muslim societies in Thailand. We have independent authorities in Aceh, in Sulu, in Sirupon, and most of this being associated with historical sultanate figures in those respective areas. And we have it all over the world as well. 
progressing as we talked. And the general idea for Dina Dirham tomorrow will be a worldwide transfer of wealth based on consensual commerce. Because the underlying factor that drives us to adopt Dinar and Dirham is based on this precept, consensus. In Islam, we are commanded to trade with mutual consent. So if I have something of value to sell, which you would like to buy, I would like in return to have something of value as well. And civilization has proven that gold and silver has always been metals of value. I'll just recap a quick example. In those days of the companions of the Prophet, for example, a chicken can be bought for one dirham. So you can see today, one dirham, which has an equivalent rate of 25 ringgit, according to WIM, can buy you a chicken as well, a good quality chicken, organic chicken perhaps. And one dinar in those days could get you a goat or a lamb. One dinar today at almost 800 ringgit can get you not the same lamb, because that was quite some time ago, but another lamb of equivalent quality or breed. So you see, the value of dinar and dirham throughout the ages for more than a thousand years has remained virtually stable or constant. The whirlwind rides of ups and downs and highs and lows, the roller coaster graphs that we all see, is a result of fiat money. So that's why we have to understand our desire to return to dinars and dirhams is a desire to return to real money, real value, real, real world. Okay, I have to read it, right? So what is the destiny? We're looking at a global good. Whether you're Muslims or not, we all share the need to bring good to this world. So why I am here is because the outlook of precious metals has always been intrinsically tied to the international financial system. And we believe we firmly believe that the world will return to a gold and silver monetary standard, which has been proven resilient throughout history, until recently forcefully taken away from us. Can okay, understand that? For more than a thousand years, empires throughout the world have been using gold and silver. It works. Suddenly, a few bright sparks came up with the idea of replacing real value with controllable or artificial value in the form of fiat money preceded by promissory notes but their target was fiat money so that they can print as much as they want. So fiat money as it is now the world's reserve currency the US dollar has only been with us for less than 50 years. And it is already showing signs of failure. We may not realize that because most of us are below 50. And those above 50 may not be old enough yet to understand the treachery or deception of the fiat money. So if we look back for a longer period of time, between precious metals as currency and fiat money as currency, there's no contest. 
It is an indisputable fact that fiat money will fail. And therefore, it requires our immediate attention and action to ensure that our civilization as we know it continue to function. Now, we are lucky that we are here in Malaysia. If you were in Zimbabwe, you would have felt the horrifying effects of hyperinflation. Money becoming worthless overnight by the second. So we have to prepare that happening at a bigger scale. Because throughout history, fiat money has always failed without fail. Sorry for using fail twice. But fiat money has always failed. So we have to prepare ourselves. And among the efforts that well, we from WIM are doing is to prepare dinar and dirham for the people. So when will the world witness a widespread use of dinar and dirham or any other gold and silver coin? So this is where I come to. Our need to act. I call it the dinar revolution. So my boss in Germany was saying, Irwan, why are you using the word revolution? And that will raise too many eyebrows. We don't want a Malaysian hot spring to happen. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the revolution which I mentioned here is more akin to the revolution of your car engine. The cycle, the frequency of rotation, oh, you get what I mean, right? So, a revolution. So what do we need to do? We need to revolute the dinar in society, to circulate the dinar, and when I say dinar, it applies to dirhams as well. We need to circulate these coins in the community. That is the dinar revolution. And I will explain to you, in accordance with the theme of this event of making money, which we do not explicitly promote as investment, but I will show you how being part of the dinar revolution will be a win-win situation for everyone concerned. Nobody loses except for those holding on to fiat money. I'm sorry for those guys. But as uh, William Lau did just now, I will have to state, it's not on the slide, but I will have to state that uh, the disclaimer that this is not a investment advisory blah 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 no liability for mental or physical spiritual financial losses <laughs> just take it as it is okay now i'm going to giving you the magic formula get your notebooks ready <laughs> this is fun. If it was this hard, nobody would be doing the dinar and dirham, okay? <laughs> now, the dinar revolution is simple. It's all about circulation cycles. And here we have the facts and figures um, to get you started off with. Now, today's official rate of dinar is 798. In our launch, on the 12th of August 2010, it was 581. One year on, it was 818. At the very peak, it was 871. Now, if we look today, it's 798. But one year ago from today, it's 634. So based on these figures, we can have 
uh, I'm missing the label here, appreciation percentages of the dinar. This is referring to the dinar, but you can apply the same to dirhams as well. In year one, the dinar appreciated 41%. Um, year to this day, it has appreciated 26%. Uh, to the peak, from its introduction, to the peak, it was 50%. To date, from launch to today, it is 37%. So just playing around with uh, all these figures, we get a year average appreciation of 38%. Okay, so that, those are the figures that we're using to headline this discussion. Okay, so if you have one dinar in your pocket and an annual appreciation of 25%, we are using very conservative figures here, unless um, we are in the blow of face as William says, then it's negative 25, but I won't go there. Uh, so a monthly prorated appreciation of 2%. So if you have one dinar in your pocket and you play your role in the revolution and sell that dinar every month, if you have one dinar, you won't get any discount for buying it anyway. By the end of the year, logically, at 25% appreciation, your money would have grown 25%. And that's very logical. A modest return, but much better, I think, for those of you concerned than your, than your fixed deposits or your EPS or your um, the new government pension scheme or what have you. Now, if you have 10 dinars in your pocket, things begin to look more interesting. Let's say your master agent gives you a good discount of 1%, and you maintain your revolution at selling your coins, all your coins, and restocking every month. So there's 12 cycles in a year. So by the end of the year, your fund would have grown 250%. Now, isn't that exciting? And you would have 155% profit over your initial placement. Well, it can go on. If you are wealthy enough to, in, to have 100 dinar to revolve, and at that quantity of 100 dinars, you would probably get a 2.5% discount. By the end of the year, your money would have grown 464%. And as the best example that I would like to show you now is 1,000 dinars. You can see here down there, 1,000 dinars, because if you go to any mama shop in Malaysia, you will see a calligraphy of an assistance from the Quran, and it's called the 1,000 dinar sentence, ayat seribu dinar. So it's a very common interest of Muslims here in Malaysia. So if they really had 1,000 dinar and really followed becoming our agent, this is what would greet them. Of course, at 1,000 dinars and in a fund placement of 798,000, you get the maximum discount of 5%. Your money would grow 659% by the end of the year. So these are figures, mind-numbing figures, which uh, when I initially came up with, uh, it was rather I was rather filled with disbelief, but uh, I think a very famous intellect concurred with me, and it works on the same principle, 
that the most powerful force on earth is compound interest. And this essentially captures that force. There's no interest here, but through revolutions, your capital will go. So there is prospects for people who are interested to get this real money out into the public for the greater good, it's definitely a win. It's definitely a win. Even if appreciation is 0%, that's still a win because of our mechanics of discount for agents and so on, but more details outside the hall. And why is it a win-win situation for everybody? It's because at the end of the day, bearing in mind the collapse of fiat money and the de facto role of precious metals back as currency, values will be left in the hands of everyone. Now this is not some kind of Ponzi scheme. This is not some kind of get rich quick scheme. This is a real, a real revolution that everyone will benefit from. Oops. This doesn't work for Excel. Those are the numbers that will make you numb. So get ready to take the leap of faith. If you want to go far enough, understand that Islam offers you a comprehensive solution in life. But otherwise, you can stick to the gold in us and the silver in us. So, notwithstanding what we've just technically heard from our excellent previous speakers just now, this is a short blurb which I wrote um, late last year. Now understand this. There's about 8 trillion worth of all the mined gold in the world. Okay, in the whole world, if you collect all the gold that has been mined, there's about 8 trillion USD worth. But not everything is for sale only a small fraction is for sale. You can only buy a small fraction of that in Philippines. The rest are being held by those deceptful people who introduce fiat money to us. Now, in the world, there is more than 15 trillion dollars, US dollars alone. 15 trillion in US dollars alone. And that's M3. It's not counting M2, M1, or any other world currency, Euro included. And almost none of it, virtually none of it, is backed by gold. So all this money in the world, if you know, and I know, and they know, that all this money in the world will be worthless. They would start buying gold. But is there enough gold? Okay. <laughs> the stop sign. I'll just finish it in one second. There's not enough gold. So what's going to happen? There's not enough gold. There's not enough gold, ladies and gentlemen. The price of gold will accelerate it accelerate upwards until pricing no longer makes any sense because fiat collapses. So ladies and gentlemen, the real gold rush has begun. So it, the dinar revolution is immensely rewarding. Earthly for all of us and holistically, especially for the Muslims, because not only are we doing this for the greater good of man, but also as our religious obligations. And it is an immediate reality. You can do it now, it's happening now, the dinar revolution is here. 
And finally, uh, as a finishing fable, remember the story of the goose that laid the golden egg. The goose is back. Don't kill it this time. Nurture it and make it go around. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.